So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Faltus and I work uh, for Czech uh, NGO People in Need. Český je to člověk tisně, nevím, jestli tady jsou nějaký český mluvčí. <laughs> Minimálně. Uh, so the presentation will be in English and I will be introducing um, water sanitation sector in the view of uh, the work of non-government uh, organization, international NGOs, uh, and uh, this will be about the approach to water and sanitation, how we do it in, in, uh, in people in need or in short in PIN. And uh, I will give you a kind of brief overview of the basic uh, issues and challenges that we are trying to solve all over the world. And, which are connected to access to safe water and safe sanitation. Uh, so the presentation will be about 30, 40 minutes and uh, then we have some questions. Uh, or if you, if you will need some clarifications of if, if anything is not clear during my presentation, please uh, feel free to raise hands and then ask uh, straight away. So uh, first, uh, what, what problems we are trying to solve here? Yeah, what are the problems with access to, to water and sanitation in the world? You know that uh, water and sanitation is one of the sustainable development goals, so it's one of the global problems that uh, the, the humankind or the mankind is, is trying to tackle, that uh, vast um, uh, numbers of people in the world do not have access to three basic things. Uh, first of them is uh, access to safe water. I'm not talking about water as such, but to safe drinking water, to a water that has a certain quality that is drinkable, that is usable on the household level. And you can see only... Uh, uh, so three people out of ten do not have access to safe water. That means uh, three people out of ten in the world globally, they do not have access on, on the household level in their homes. They do not have access to safe water and have th these people have to make some effort to, 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 to bring water, to, to have water in their households to, to be able to, uh, to live some decent life. Uh, then six out of ten people, they do not have uh, sanitation services, uh, sanitation facilities. Papa will be speaking about sanitation a little bit more, a little bit later. But uh, basically, this is about access to uh, sanitation facilities, uh, basically latrines. In, in the countries of the Global South, we are facing a lot of uh, problems with sanitation, which is uh, open defecation and open defecation leads to a um, um, kind of spread of, of a lot of uh, uh, diseases. Uh, there is a lack of, lack of sanitation on, on rural level. There is lack of sanitation also on, on, uh, on, uh, in institutions. And the third one, third problem that uh, we are trying to solve is the, the, the problem with the wastewater that a lot of water that is used in the world is not uh, treated and is uh, becoming an uh, environmental hazard and is becoming uh, a threat to, to the environment and the polluted water also pollutes the, further the, uh, the drinking water sources. So these are basically three, three problems that we are trying to solve. Not always all of them, but uh, it depends on the environment, it depends on the settings we uh, uh, we work normally in in, in combination. Uh, you can have in the same area. You can have a problem with access to water, and more often or quite often, you have also a problem with uh, sanitation services. And the problem with uh, the wastewater is normally on um, more populated in more populated areas in urban settings. Uh, it's not such a big problem in, in rural areas where you have uh, uh, very low population density. So, so not, uh, the problem with wastewater is not, not, a, big, not a big issue in, in rural areas.
So access to water, if we look at the, 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 first, the first challenge, the first problem we're trying to solve, is uh, divided into four, uh, four, four different challenges. First one is, is, the, is the water quantity. So that's the, the, that's the amount of water that each person has available per day. So that was connected to the question that was raised in the, in the beginning, how much water do you need for your needs for uh, every day? Uh, it, of course, it depends on the situation where a person lives or where the family lives. But uh, we have international standards, we have minimum humanitarian standards where you should have a minimum amount of water per person per day. And these standards, we are, these are our targets. We, we try to, in, in different crises, in different situations, in, in after catastrophes, after wars, in different uh, emergency settings, we are trying to reach this standard. And the minimum standard per person per day is 15 liters per second, per, per person per day. So, so this is the, the minimum calculation that each person should have according to international humanitarian standards. <coughs> uh, the second one is, the, is, of course, the water quality. As I said in the beginning, uh, the water is around us. Yeah, you can you can see you can find water everywhere. There is, uh, you know, the, the water covers the most of the most of the earth, but. Uh, 99% of it is not drink, not uh, drinking quality. So uh, the, the drinking quality is, is our concern as well. And what is necessary to when we talk about delivery of safe water to uh, target populations, we talk about uh, uh, water in good quantity and in for, for about water in good quality. So. There are like certain parameters that you need to observe regarding the water quality, uh, biological and chemical parameters that you need to uh, then you need to observe. And uh, if the water does not uh, comply with uh, with the standards, we of course we need to make some solutions with like water treatment. There are water treatment measures on, on different levels. There are like centralized water treatment, or there is like a water treatment on a household level. For example, if uh, a family is not able to collect water in safe quality, we distribute uh, a chlorination tablets, for example, just for you to, to be able to imagine how the water quality is actually ensured. Uh, the third one is uh, access. And that's about how far how far is it to the next uh, to the nearest water source? You like we here in in developed world in the in the north we we do not really have a problem with access because the water is everywhere around us and the distribution networks are very dense. But uh, if you go to the south, you will see that uh, the distances to to water are often very great. You know that. that the, the source itself is far away from the from the home from the home from the households, and the families, the people, they have to make some effort to access it. And it's about time. It's about safety of people, and it's about uh, sometimes it's it's also connected to the child labor or chi child uh, co connect like ch how children are. Uh, connected to uh, to delivery of water because, uh, as I said, sometimes you have long distances to to fetch water. It takes long time. It takes hours to to reach nearest water source. And if children are uh, responsible for water delivery in the family, they cannot spend time in schools, for example. It's also also about the safety because sometimes the the distances are are long. Sometimes people spend long long times delivering water. They wait for water in long queues, and then when they come back with uh, uh, water canisters, water jerry cans, it can be after dark, and it can be concern of safety as well. <coughs> so so this is also something we look at. The, it's the water access, <coughs> and of course the. The, the, the last one is the sustainability, is, is, is mostly about functionality of the services. If we invest money 
if we have the, the trust from the donor, the donor gives us the money, we can spend on the access to water, they, they very much look at the sustainability and if the service <coughs> is available for, for a long time. Uh, I will show you on the slide a little bit later how, how we look at the functionality of the water services. Uh, because it's connected with the initial investment, how much money we invest into water uh, supply, water infrastructure, water services in the beginning, and what is what is the what is the duration of the service that we that we, we provide with that. So that means we don't only construct, we don't only uh, rehabilitate or repair the water sources, but we also look at the management. We we look at the financing. We look at the uh, overall organization of the, 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 the water systems, water supply, or water networks. Just to give you a br brief idea what where people in it works, we work in mainly in the global south, but you can see about uh, the, the, the dots that we work in uh, about three or four countries in, in Africa. We work in Middle East, we work in Afghanistan, a little bit also in the, in the Southeastern Asia. And, and, and quite recently we have quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of interventions in Ukraine. Uh, so this is about the detail. This is, for example, Southern Ethiopia where, we, uh, where our water sanitation, what we call WASH program, is, is the biggest. And, and this is how we, we kind of make the evidence and we, we also we, we collect the data about the water sources that we address and that we repair and rehabilitate and we put it on the map. And you can see the density of, of, of our intervention on the, from the geographical point of view. Most of the interventions are in the rural areas, but, but we now are recently starting to work in, in bigger towns. In, in uh, where population is over 50,000 people. Uh, so there are some principles that we try to try to uh, adhere to or to try to uh, observe and the, the one of them is that the water is a human right. So when we the access to water is one of the human rights. When we are uh, start our work in the area of intervention, in the selected area, in the new project, we try to speak to the authorities, to the responsible authorities who are the owners of the water systems, who are the owners of the water sources, that the people we work with, they have the right to access water. People have rights, but people also have responsibilities. So the, it's, it comes hand in hand and we have some kind of capacity building or awareness raising programs on how people should be should be understanding understanding the problem with access to water that on one hand access to water is human right but on the other hand people have responsibilities and some duties to um, to allow authorities to to provide water to the communities so that, that there is basically payment for water. We, so we also work, look at tariffs and we look at payment for water. So you have some funding for operational maintenance of the water systems. Uh, secondly, one of our principles is that you, if we have infrastructure failure, which is something breaks down, like a pump, like you can imagine like a simple pump, you have uh, a localized water source, which is like a hand pump, and uh, a hand pump breaks. You know, children play with it. There is a, a you know, the material doesn't uh, doesn't last very long. So you have the break of the pump, and you have non-functional water source. In our point of view, that the, the, this kind of failure of the infrastructure is not a failure of the service. So, so we try to make the system strong or sustainable that uh, in case of the breakage or in, in case of some repair case of the uh, certain water source, 
the system around it is built in the way that it is repaired without any external help. So, so we try to kind of build the system around the source that uh, the responsible authorities or the community has got powers and has got ability to, to put it back into functionality. So this is like the basic, basic principle. So if there is anything not clear, just raise your hand. And to, to that is connected uh, the system strengthening. So we, we, we're looking at the whole system around the water, so we don't look only at the, at the source itself, but we look at, at around the system. This is what I just explained. So this is about the system strengthening. And today's is connecting the, the professionalization. So, so it is necessary if you have a water system or water distribution network, you need professionals to operate it, to maintain it and to manage it. Now, in the global south, especially in the rural areas, we see quite a lot um, the community management. It's, it's, this is, these are the voluntary uh, water management communities. These are mainly people who live in the communities. They are, these are mainly farmers or small businessmen who are given that responsibility to manage these, these water sources. But these people are not professionals. These positions are voluntary. And we've been facing a lot of problems with this setup. Because uh, first of all, the knowledge, uh, experience, and motivation of people to, to actually to manage these community water sources. So we try to push into more kind of professional approach that we have people who, are, who get paid for, for maintaining and for, for repairing the services. So it's very much about the funding and the, the, the finances. Uh, this is what I just mentioned. That's the, this is something we call investment loss. That you get, it could be us, it could be anybody else, it could be governments. They invest into water infrastructure, but without proper maintenance, without proper management, without proper operation, you will have you will have the system, you will have the infrastructure failure. And there are statistics, there are statistics that up to 30 to 40 percent of built infrastructure is broken down, is non-functional within two years because of lack of maintenance and management. So, uh, so we have these activities that we try to decrease something which is called downtime. And downtime is the, the time of, of the non-functionality of the systems. So we, we try to build the systems that they are, they are kind of self-repairable, that, that there is, uh, there is uh, the, the authority or the, uh, the administration or the owner of the water source has got ability, capacity, the finance, and the knowledge how to put, put the infrastructure back into operation. Because everything breaks. Yeah? You cannot really avoid it. But to put it back into operation, it's, it's another thing. Uh, so this is more about our programs. I, I, I gave you a little bit more in, insight of what we do. But this is, this is more, more general. We that the best impact that you can reach in, uh, in the development work is, is when you integrate more sectors together. When you go, you can have kind of combined program. You can have one project which combines more, uh, more sectors, as we call. So you can see you can have water be, being present <coughs> in health. So that's, that's quite obvious because uh, Water is very much connected to health. If you don't have clean water, if you don't have uh, proper washing facilities, <coughs> you will end up with a lot of waterborne diseases. You will end up with uh, uh, diarrhea. You will end up with cholera. You will end up with uh, malnourished uh, children because of uh, it, um, acute watery diarrhea and stuff like that. You have water connected with education. 
that's what also what I mentioned. We need to train professionals to maintain, to manage, to operate the systems. Uh, you have water connected with nutrition. That's that's also connected with health. Health. If you don't have clean water for children, you will, you will have you will end up with malnourished children. If you don't have enough water for uh, irrigating your garden, you will end up having a very simple diet or the diet that does not really give you enough nutrition, nutritional food, for example, and then you will be, you will be having food that is, uh, uh, that is, that is creating a, a malnutrition or stunting you know, with children. You have water with natural resources. This is very much connected with uh, climate change today because we are facing, you know, everybody knows very much about climate change and we are facing the changes in the weather patterns, you know. So you, we have, on one hand, we have droughts and on the other hand, we have, we have uh, floods and this will be increasing and the impact will be higher in the global south because the global south is not as resilient to these shocks as, as we are here. So, so natural resources is about the, the, the climate, the climate resilience, and we, in, in connection with water, we are speaking about uh, water retention and water recharge. Because if you are using the underground water sources, which are not recharged because of the, the, the rains, the kind of regular pattern of rains, if you don't have that, you, you are not getting the recharge of the underground water sources and if you are depleting the water sources from the underground, you will be, uh, um, you will be losing the water sources in some time. Uh, we have water connected with agriculture, of course, this is mainly connected with uh, irrigation. Again, this is connected to climate change because more and more we will be facing uh, this kind of disruption of the weather patterns. So we have heavy rains and then we have uh, droughts and we will be more and more dependent on um, irrigation. And the last one is the markets, you know, the market system develop because the water is also a commodity. How much time we have? Is it, is it okay? Yeah, pool for me. Uh, because uh, water is a commodity. So the water should be treated as a commodity. It's, it should be valued as a commodity and it should be given the price. You know, the water has price. So the water is part of the markets. Not only because the markets need water, as like speaking about businesses and, and uh, industry, for example, but also because the water needs to be marketed. Otherwise, there is no sustainability. So this is the integration. Yeah, so uh, just to give you a very brief overview, what do we do in practice? We build things, of course, we build infrastructure. So we repair broken infrastructure, we repair latrines, we repair uh, water reservoirs, we repair boreholes. We build new ones, not as much, because as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of, there's a lot of investment into water infrastructure, but in two years, you have high ratio of the failure of the breakage. So we focus very much on putting things back to operation rather than building new, new things. Building systems, did I also mentioned that, you know, we also not only on the local level, looking at the management, looking at the operation maintenance, but we try to look also on the, this is something that we call advocacy, on the like a government level, if we have enough power, you know, but uh, it's not possible everywhere. You need to have some certain <laughs> size of the organization to be able to do that and, and to try to uh, in, uh, be involved or kind of to influence the policies, the policies, the bylaws, even the, in the legislation of the, of, the, of, the, of the countries or the, even the regions or the districts of, with the local government in relation to access to water. Yeah. How, what are the regulations? Who is allowed to drill a new borehole? Who is allowed to sell water? Who is allowed to set tariffs? 
how, what are the tariffs? What are the tariffs? How high? <coughs> There's a lot of finance. There's a lot of corruption, of course, about. So we look at the, uh, the accountability, transparency, and anti-corruption measures as well. So this is something which we call uh, governance. So water governance is also another issue. Uh, education, so I also mentioned that. Uh, we, for example, work with uh, technical vocational education uh, institutions, which is uh, secondary education, basically. And we try to uh, we train uh, technicians, uh, operators, um, technical people, technical people to be able to to operate sometimes complicated electrical electromechanical systems, because sometimes you need some power to 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 transport water from the ground to the hill, you know. So you need some certain at least some basic uh, technologies and, and you need educated people to operate it. And then of course we have campaigns, yeah? we have hygiene sanitation, promotion campaigns, awareness, how to wash hands, changing behavior, you know, this is very much connected with hygiene. We try to change behavior to, to teach people how to that, that raise the importance of the hand washing, of the, the, the personal hygiene and stuff like that. So, so this is in bullet points uh, what we do in practice. Uh, uh, when this is a little bit more into detail, but when we speak about building systems, which is very abstract probably for you. <laughs> Uh, we look at these uh, building blocks, this is something which is called building blocks, yeah? So we look on like a nine different levels of the system that will ensure the sustainability, yeah? The further functionality of, this, of the, the infrastructure, for example, that we invest in, that we repair. Policy, institutions, infrastructure, data, very important, the collection and management of data, because without data, no manager is allowed to work. Planning, the same. Finance, of course. Regulation, I talk about that, the, the, the laws, the government, the policies, the governance, basically. Management, and behind that is, is kind of learning and being adapt, being to being able to learn from failures, being to take lessons learned, being able to innovate, yeah, being able to critically think about different challenges. Uh, and when we talk about management, you can you can imagine like a simple water source, like a, like when you go in Africa, you go to the rural area and you find uh, a local decentralized water source, which is like a shallow well with a hand pump. And the, the, services, the services around this uh, simple water source, we, we have three levels of the services. Yeah? First are the water users. These are the people who actually take the water and consume. They are consumers, customers. Yeah? <coughs> They are like everyday people who live around and use the water. Then you have service providers, which is uh, somebody who manages, who sometimes is the owner, of course. It, it could be private, but it's mostly the public office who owns, like the local government, who owns the water source. So we look at the water providers. So we make sure that the water providers actually provide the service to the users. Yeah. So this, but the users also have responsibilities, as I, as I mentioned. And the third level is the authorities. These are the regional, federal, national government, whatever. And they are responsible for, uh, for regulation, governance, and supervision, of course. So, so this is what, how we recognize about this, like a simple, when you look, at like a simple hand dug well with operated with hand pump in the rural areas in Africa, you should have these three levels of the service. Sometimes difficult to imagine, but uh, it should be in place. Uh, 
So we work in, like basically we work in rural areas and urban areas. So that means villages and towns. There are some specifications of rural water services. They are mostly decentralized. That means uh, when, you, when you travel around the countryside, you have lots of fields, farms, different type of uh, environment. And uh, you have decentralized villages and, and decentralized households. So, so sometimes the villages, the population density is low. And uh, you have the households are spread out. So, and that's, that, this is what we call like decentralized sources because they are not connected to one central system. And these are quite, quite difficult to manage because you, get, you have to have lots of little management bodies to manage these uh, decentralized sources rather than if you have like one large system <coughs> which is operated from one office, it's much easier to to, to work with it, to, to manage it. Uh, MUS is, is a multiple use of water services. That means that uh, we look at the water source not from single, single user uh, usage, but uh, the, 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 the source is used for, for, multiple, for multiple purposes. So that, that means, first of all, it's a drinking purpose, you know, the household purpose. But you have water also for animals, for production. You have agriculture production, you have livestock production for livestock or irrigation, for livestock feeding, or for your business. Yeah? So, so one source can be used for multiple purposes. This is, this is the case in the rural area. You have larger distances, you have the issues with, with the water quality, because again, it's decentralized, so you cannot really, you, can, you cannot easily control lots of small sources. You cannot really very well and efficiently control the water quality. In contrast, if you have like a big uh, cities like Prague, you have like one or two, three water treatment stations, and th these are like very easy to to operate and to maintain because you have like central system, and you can you can ensure the water quality there. But if you have lots of decentralized sources, you, it's quite more difficult. And uh, the last one is what I call, that's the professionalization, that uh, people uh, should be customers, they should be uh, having voice to, to speak, you know, to, to raise their concerns. If, uh, there are any issues with the water services. It should be owned, they should, it should be participated, but, but not managed. It should not, the, the water systems should not be managed by the communities. It should be managed by professionals. So these are some uh, characteristics of the rural, rural uh, access to water. Um, on urban settings, it's, the, the work is totally different that we do. We work with utilities, yeah, we work with uh, like a local management, it's, it's, it's normally public companies, we, we work with public companies and we, we mainly work on the capacity building. So that, that's about education, that's about delivery of equipment, quite a lot as well. So we educate people, or raise capacities, do the capacity building, and, and we also donate some, some equipment, some measuring equipment, uh, repair equipment, maintenance equipment, operation, data collection, computers, whatever. And, and we measure the quality of the service. We have these 10 uh, performance indicators. And so you, looking at these indicators, you can imagine what is the work about. Yeah, so, so we have a look how much, how, how many people are served with, with the water within that, within one um, location, one town, for example. You have 50,000 people town, and how many, what is the proportion of population which is served by the water services provided by the utility. Second one is the average hours of water supply. So is the, is the water supply intermittent or not? Yeah, is it, is it like, is it 24-7? Is it, is it continuous water supply or is the water distributed in shifts, which is quite a lot of, it's, it's a case in a lot, of, uh, a lot of situations because there's not enough sources 
and the, the you know that the de demand is higher than s than supply. Yeah, so so you need to have shifts in uh, in, in in water delivery because there is not enough for everybody basically. So so this is this is the big problem in, in let's say Middle East in um, in in some sub-Saharan African countries. Water quality. Um, then there is. I will not speak about all the indicators, but for example, we look at, at the, the, the something which is called non-revenue water, and it's called it's it's about uh, water loss. It's about water leakages. If you can, if you want to imagine it physically, you have broken pipe on the way, the delivery pipe which is broken, and you're losing 20% of water on the way to the household. And this water is non-revenue water because this is this is the water that you produce that you have to pump out from the ground. You sometimes you have to store it somewhere. You have to treat it. So you have to. There is some cost connected to it. There is some effort, but you you don't get any money for it. You don't get because it's it's lost. Yeah, it's it's because there is a there is a physical leakage. And, and this is this 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 water is called non-revenue. And and but it, this is not only physical non-revenue, but there is also other types of non-revenue water. But I will not go to the details. So this is just for you to imagine how we work in on on town in on 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 the level of of uh, urban urban settings, which is like very very different from urb, from rural ones. Uh, I spoke a lot about finance. And, and, we, and we look about the, fi uh, we, you, you know, this is the basic principle of financing. You have some income and you have some expenditure. You have it in your home, yeah? you have it everywhere. You need to compare your income with your expenditure. If you are, Cost is higher than your income. You 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 are in trouble. Yeah, you will you will be in debt, and it's exactly the same in in water services. You, your financial sources, your income, must be higher than your costs. Otherwise, you will the service will will fail. Yeah, sooner or later. So we look at that. We kind of collect the data about how much water is produced, how much does it cost, what are the salaries, how much, what is the, what is the expenditure, and how much, you, how much the, 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 the management, the utilities, or the water committees, how much they collect from the people by like selling water, selling water to people, installing the tariffs. And, and also we have some, uh, tips how to increase the revenue and how to decrease the expenditure. If you have low transparency, you have a lot of corruption, and you have, you have obsolete systems, your expenditure will be high. But you can increase that, you can increase transparency, you can decrease corruption, and you can modernize, you can innovate, and you will have savings. Yeah? You will have energy savings, and you have financial savings. Or you can you can increase the revenue, you can increase the income. So uh, you look at the, for example, at the illegal connections. Some people, this is connected to again to non-revenue water. If you have a lot of illegal connections, people who do do not pay for water, you will end up with a lower lower income. So this is about the finance. And uh, I have, I think, one, one or two last uh, slides, and I will, I will finish. And <clears throat> so, at the end, we need to monitor our work. We need to know how how we do, how, how the activities that we do in the field. How is it? Does it make any sense? Does it have any impact or not? So we have this is like a service ladder, and. There is like a different type. There is high service, so there is no service, and there are some steps in between. And we look again at the quality, quantity, accessibility, and reliability of service. So, at the end, or even during the project implementation, we look at these uh, four uh, topics, 
and we look if the quantity that we provide to people is high service or no, the quality, accessibility, and reliability. So, so this is kind of scoring system of um, of the, the access to water services. And that was the last slide. Um, yeah. for the presentation, organization people need. Please, if you have any questions to the presentation you just saw, I have a question. So, how many wells you are, for example, in Ethiopia, how many wells you are like, dealing with? How many thousands of uh, um. units? That's the projects, yeah. You have like one project starts and finishes, another go, another go, and so like when we look over like the 20 years, it's about 1,000 locations, 1,000 points, yeah, that we built. Uh, it's different type of infrastructure. It can be like a simple water point. It can be uh, like a hand washing station at the latrine. It can be 200 meter cubic reservoir, a big one. It can be like a 300 meter deep uh, borehole. It's different types of infrastructure. But the, the points that we have is about, about 1,000. But some of them are 20 years old. Yeah? So uh, we try to monitor that, even like, uh, like not, not being limited by the, you know, the project duration. We try to look at this kind of long-term sustainability. So, so we organize some missions to, to travel to locations where we worked uh, four, five, ten years ago, and look what is the what is the the status of the source. Did we do a good job in the in the, in the management, like building capacity of the management, or not? If we go there, the source is non-functional and nobody cares. We did a bad job, yeah. If we go there after ten years, five, two years, ten years, and it still works, we did a good job. Basically, this is like a very simple, <laughs> very simple thing. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, what is the No, this is this is UN. This is UN data. So this is global. So this is like uh, like all over the world. This is considering uh, Europe, North America. Uh, this is a, this is a global number, yeah. And this number is, uh, I think it's kind of five, ten years old. And and we have something which is called sustainable development goals. Because we had, you know, that's a UN. Uh, that's a UN goal. Yeah, how to how to how to increase, how to kind of how to de de decrease the poverty and how to how to do the development, how to how to develop the the the, the, the global uh, the global civilization. Yeah, and. Uh, the sustainable goals that are that, that were built after uh, uh, the, the millennium goals and it, the, these there are some indicators that uh, we're trying to reach between 2015 and 2030. Yeah, so and there are the goals are set for 2030. Yeah, the UN Development Goals, and the, the goals say that in 2030, the access to water should be. 10 out of 10, yeah? And that's the goal, that's the goal of the UN, yeah, of the United Nations. But um, because of, we have all the crisis, we have, we have climate change, we have all the wars, we had COVID, the situation is going backwards, yeah? So not only that we are, we will be able to uh, provide access to water to everybody, but we might end up even on the lower level that we started. Yeah. 
And second question, uh, you say that uh, access to water is a human right, and uh, a few minutes later you say the water is commodity on market. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's, not, it's not contradiction. I don't think it's a contradiction because you have, you have rights and you have responsibilities. If you own something, if you own a house, it's yours. You can use it, you, can, you, you are rich, yeah? but you also have obligation to, to, to look after the house. Yeah? For example. Yeah? So we are like citizens of a country and we should be, our government should be responsible for giving us access to water, but our obligation will be pay for it. They cannot give it to us for free. Uh, yeah? say that uh, you can take water uh, if you don't uh, use it like commodity, you have free access to this water. I, I'm talking about uh, drinking water. Yeah, I'm not talking about water as, as such, yeah? because uh, of course if you go to the river or to the sea or to the lake, the water is available, but, but the, the, the drinking water, which is available to you on the household level, for example, in good quality, good quantity, that, that's not, that's some, somebody needs to make an effort to, to, to provide the water to you. And they are responsible to do it, but you should be uh, paying for the service. Of course, you know, we have, because we, we also work with, um, poor families, like a low, like vulnerable families, for example. So we, we try to also imply like something which is called social tariff, so that people, these like vulnerable people, they do, they do not pay the full cost, for example. Yeah? So the, the majority of people, they pay a little bit more to, uh, for, for, the, for the vulnerable people to have, like, let's say, free access, for example.